Este programa es patrocinado por Global Premier Staffing, tu agencia de empleo. Ahorra tiempo y dinero. Llámanos a los teléfonos que ves en pantalla. Te atendemos en el sur de California. Global Premier Staffing. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Betty, and I am so excited to be with you this morning. Uh, we are here with Randy Long, who's the founder of Long Business Advisors. And um, I'm very excited to have you with us today, Randy, because... Uh, first of all, you are someone that I met a long time ago when we were writing our first book, and now you've just recently written a second book. Uh, we have spoken to thousands of professionals together, and I remember we spoke in Arizona, and because of the content, because of your content, we received the highest scores in the entire week's conference in Arizona, and it was an, uh, a national conference. And the whole thing about preparing your business and your family for a successful exit, um, the, name of, the name of Randy's book, by the way, is Bulletproof Your Exit. And so with, uh, with this, I have a personal experience Um, that I want to share with the audience and then I want to talk, I, I want to bring it to you. Uh, my father passed away and my father was a successful businessman. He had a transportation company. He had uh, semi trucks that used to travel all over the country and, and um, transporting whatever wheat and potatoes and whatever it was. The deal was my dad passed away. And when I was little, he used to take me places. And, you know, I thought he was, he was just lonely, but he was actually teaching me how to be an entrepreneur and how to be a business leader. He thought he had done a really good job by telling me everything about the business. So he thought, and then he passed away. I went to look and there was no one to help me. And um, the way that he did the transition From a tax perspective, he wasn't ready. From a transition perspective, he wasn't ready. I ended up taking the business. I have three brothers. He didn't direct who he wanted the business to go to. It ended up by default that my brothers and I decided that I was going to run it from the United States. And, um, and so it was very difficult for me because I was here in the United States. I had a senior level uh, position and trying to run the business, a male dominated business from the United States. I did it, but I will never again um, allow any of my people, my friends, my family, anyone to go through the same heartache that I went through. And, and Randy, when I met you, uh, that your level of integrity, your level of professionalism, your knowledge base, Um, and just who you are was exactly what cost me to um, come to you. And so why don't you tell us about yourself? And then I want to dig into your book because I went through your book with a fine tooth comb. And it's, by the way, everybody here should purchase this book. And, and this, I want this video to go viral because people need to know this. 95% of the business owners don't have a plan 95% that's been proven so so Randy thank you so much for being with us oh it is so much my pleasure to be here Betty and I've you know over the years I've loved loved you and loved being your friend and your and your advisor so it's been a great time for me and this is fun so I'm looking forward to this um, my background is is necessary for me to be able to do what I do these last especially 15 years of my career The first years of the career, I was a, a certified financial planner and I owned a wealth management firm. And I thought I was pretty smart, but after working a few years with a number of business owners, I realized there was so much I didn't know. So I decided to go to law school. So I went to law school and then I practiced law for um, many, many years, 25 years or so. And I did basically estate planning work in business business work, transition work, that sort of thing. And so all of my, all of my target market was always business owners and, and families that were part of that whole business complex. And so it's been um, having the background of the 25 years worth of that work led me into starting the, this as a consulting business where 
I'm not the lawyer, I'm not the financial planner, I'm not the anything, I'm, I'm the exit planner. And the exit planner is sort of like a general contractor, I guess you might say, right? I don't yes. do all the work, but I do, I do work off the plan, which we build with the owner and we execute it and build the house. And we get this thing done because really every business owner needs it done. Um, I, absolutely. And, and I want everybody to know that um, you have been my personal business advisor. I, we've had to make some moves very recently and we've had to do some, some different things. And, and for years now, um, you've been an advisor to me personally. And um, I love you and I trust you. And, uh, uh, and, and it's just your, your process. Um, let me give you some scenarios and um, uh, of some of the conversations that you and I have had that I think a lot of the audience um, uh, shares also. Um, and so, so let's talk about uh, a business owner who is thinking about selling a business. Um, and it was a friend of mine who was thinking about selling a business. And I asked him, hey, do you have and this, this, was, this happened to have been a, an older business owner, but it could also be a younger business owner. Mm -hmm. And uh, thinking about selling a business, and it was a substantial business. And this individual um, didn't have a, a, a succession plan for uh, the wife, for the children. And, and in your book, I mean, you call it How to Prepare for Your Business your, how to prepare your business and your family. Right. And, um, and that's so important because my dad, in my case, uh, thought he prepared me well, and he didn't. And he didn't prepare the whole family. And um, so if someone is thinking about selling their business, is that the best time? Or is it when you start the business, the best time to start thinking about the exit plan. Yeah, I'll, um, yes, to the last one, which yes. is um, going into a business with an understanding of what your goals are and what your sort of exit goal is, is pretty helpful. Most people don't, don't create businesses like that. They don't grow them with that in mind necessarily. But um, I would say that you can do this well somewhere between three and 10 years. The reason I say 10 years is because some businesses are growing rapidly and there's, and there's a lot of tax issues and things that we need, you know, some of the strategies can take up to 10 years to fully um, be completed. And so, uh, but apart from the tax issues, you know, we've also pulled this off with people even as, as quickly as 18 months or so. It just depends on how the business is built and what kind of complexity there is and what kind of ownership structure, all that. So, um, so why would, um, if I'm just starting a business, why do I want to think about the exit? Because I tell that this is what I tell people is, you know, right now is the perfect time. It's, it's almost like a, you know, people talk about premarital agreements for some people that use the premarital agreements or whatever. Yeah. It's, it's why at the beginning? Well, I'll give you a story. Um, the foundational pieces of the business can, um, when you very first are creating the business, you can limit your success just by how you create it. Okay. So we had uh, a case that came to us. There was a, um, a technically oriented expertise guy who came together with a marketing guy and they together built a, uh, started a company 50, 50, right? So the company starts off and the, it, it's going along, it does well. And about the third year into the business, the, um, the guy with the tech, technical expertise comes to see me. And he says, I just don't know what to do. I, this guy has 50% of my company. You know, I can't really make decisions without him because we're both managers and he does nothing and I'm doing all of the work and all the growth and I'm selling, I mean, I'm doing everything. I said, okay, let's see what we can do. So 
we went back and talked to the other business owner about the fact that he was intended to be the marketer and should be hitting numbers. We created certain numbers for him to hit. And, and if he didn't hit those, then he agreed to sell his interest. Now, he didn't have to do that. He just happened to be an honorable guy that recognized he wasn't holding up his share, but he wanted a chance to do right. And then he just realized after about six months, he, he just wasn't, he had another business he was growing and interested in. And so he just decided pursuant to the agreement we did, the guy bought him out and this dude is so happy now, mm. but he realizes how close he came to working for the rest of his life or until he sells that company 50% for somebody who gave no value. So protecting equity very early is a very big deal. Too many people give away too much equity too soon. Um, there was, um, um, in, in my family, I had an uncle who was a president of a bank and his wife was always taken care of and he was 35 years old, very wealthy and very successful. He bought a lot next to his house to play soccer with his kids and he wasn't expecting it 35 years old very healthy he was playing soccer soccer is not easy to play and all of a sudden he gets a heart attack and drops down he doesn't make it to the hospital he's dead mm -hmm. the wife inherits this is my aunt by marriage she inherits the the business and oh she inherits everything and practically um lost all her money to leeches yeah. And I call it leeches because men came to her life and they had really good investments and people enamored and in all of this that we see the widows and, and mostly when, um, when one of the people in a family, whether it be a man or a woman, have the business, I'm seeing that and I've seen that so much where they weren't prepared. She wasn't prepared. She had never done anything in the business. She didn't know anything about the business. The kids were too small. They were still in school, in high school. And so they were too small to really understand. So all of these millions and millions of money just went to leeches. Yeah. Um, you know, and tell that us issue that. comes up, not just for people that um, end up with the money because of, of accidents or bad circumstances. Yeah. It's also true of business owners that sell their company and, and come into a big windfall of money. Because like I say um, in my book, um, it's not the same thing to run a company worth $30 million as it is to manage a portfolio of $30 million. Those are completely different skill sets. Totally different, and, yes. And so before, one of the things that we like to do is we, we, we try to build counsel into the, into the owners so that they have a plan of how they're going to deal with their money before the money shows up. Because like you said, the leeches, we try to prepare them for it. We also try to encourage them if possible to keep it secret. Yeah. Because if, if people don't know, then they can't be a target. And I just can't tell you how many times, you know, the world seeks after money so much and they're willing to do anything to get it. So it's, it's nice to be private about how, what your success really is. Um, one of the things that I really like about your book, and I went through your book like a fine tooth comb because um, I see so many books out there that give you insight into this and insight into that. And, and what I like about this particular book, and the name of the book, again, is Bulletproof Your Exit, um, is, and, and the book is not out yet. So we're talking about it and we're giving a sneak preview of, of, of this great handout. And, it's, and it really is like a paint by the number, how do you do this? And, um, and there's instances when you say, you know, you really need some advice, you know, go ahead and, and, and go into my website and so forth. But, but um, it, bulletproofing your business, um, explain to, to the audience, what do you mean by bulletproof, yeah. making it bulletproof? Yeah, the bulletproof your exit has to do with um, building your company, first of all, in such a way that it is always ready for an exit. In other words, the company is being run in a way that um, makes it worth more money, easier to run, and ready to get out. And there are a number of steps, you know, to kind of get 
to, to get to that. Some of them have to do with things inside the company, of course, like, you know, everything from making sure that your legal documents are clear and clean, your accounting is clear and clean, that you're not using the company as another checkbook, you know, like another checkbook for you and personal things. There's just a whole host of sort of those smaller technical things. Mm -hmm. But big picture, there's also things like making sure that you've got a management team that doesn't need you. They can grow and run the business apart from you. And that is the place where you start to get higher multiples for your company versus those that people are running companies that need them. It, it many times turns out to be a glorified job, you know. So yeah. there's just a whole bunch of things about, you know, understanding your resources. What's the company worth? What do you have personally? How much do you need? when you leave to live the kind of life you expect to live? Are you estimating what that cost is gonna be reasonably? I mean, there's just this whole progression. That's why we run this as a process. Um, and then the, the bulletproofing also includes protecting yourself in the event things don't go the way you hope. And that is people get disabled, people die, you know, um, circumstances within families change, successors that people thought they were gonna to leave to, um, themselves die. I mean, I've seen some of these things go full circle where every, the family does everything right. And in the transition, right after the transition is complete, the child that's running the company is, and is the heir apparent dies. I mean, I've had all mm -hmm. kinds of these things. Yeah. So you've got to, you've got to, if you, if you bulletproof the business, the way we talk about bulletproof your exit, then you're, you're ready to pivot to the next way to make it successful in the event that your plans don't work out. Does that make yes. sense? Oh, absolutely. It's almost like having a, a mesh underneath you as you're swinging, right? Yeah. So you have this, this, this um, uh, yeah. opportunity to, yes, to, to, you can pivot and you can pivot within the, the you've already thought ahead of time what mm -hmm. you're going to need. It's not any different than, than thinking about buying a business, selling a business. And if, and if that buy doesn't happen, then I'm going to buy this one. But we always think in terms, you know, the, I think the mistake in, and by the way, um, Randy, you are an attorney, you're a certified financial planner, and you're a certified exit planner, all three of them. And very few attorneys are both of these, and very yeah. few certified fin uh, financial planners or exit planners are also an attorney. And that's why I personally come to you, because I know when I'm talking to you about my business, it's I'm talking to you about the entire thing. And you have helped me go into business, come out of business, modify business, all of it. Um, and so what I was saying was, most of us live our life as if we have a pink slip to our life. <laughs> like we're going to live forever. And imagine that only 5%, that means five out of 100 business owners have an exit plan. Yeah. Five out of 100 business owners know that they're going to die. Guess what, ladies and gentlemen? We started to die the moment we were born. <laughs> we are all going there. Yep. And, we, and, and the idea is to get you ready for when you do depart, that your family is ready for the business. How, I, I always think, okay, I have my trust. My kids know where my trust is. My husband knows where my trust is. This, these are the things. Having a trust is not the same as get, getting your business ready. Just because you have a trust, that doesn't mean that your business is ready for you to leave. So okay. can you talk about that, please? Yeah, that's why we, the, the book is written and we practice in such a way that we actually do it is an, an integration between business, the business planning side and the family planning side, because you can get the business all right and have the family wrong. And then what that's not success. You know, if the, if the family fails or doesn't, things don't work the way they're supposed to, even if the business was a success for you as an individual, that makes the whole thing a failure. You yeah. know? So we don't, we don't measure success in my world by dollars. It, the dollars are just, they are a natural progression of doing what's right. But they also, once the dollars show up, it doesn't mean that it's ultimately going to be a blessing for your family or you unless you're prepared for it to be. 
it can turn out like your friend, she got money, but then she was hounded by everybody. She didn't have any real financial expertise. She had no real mentors to walk her through things and protect her from the wolves. And so what, what was intended to be a good thing turned out to be a bad thing. Yeah. So it is the, the integration, if you will, of doing the business planning right and incorporating into it the family planning, like you said, you can have the living trust, which is a good piece to have in estate planning for your family, but it doesn't necessarily resolve any of the business problems. Um, I agree. I, I want to walk everybody through just the, the, the trajectory that you take the reader through the book, because you and I have had so many conversations. I feel like um, uh, it, it, we've had conversations with other people, with groups of people about this topic. So I feel like, I felt like I knew it pretty well. And then I read your book and by the way, I read your book in one night. It was yeah. just a page turner and it was so easy to read. Um, and, and, and so you have, and I, and I'm reading this cause I, I, I actually wrote down a lot of the highlights from your book and you I have you sent me the notes. I remember I was pretty impressed by that. <laughs> I just wanted, I was digesting like all of the good stuff from it. And so from making the decision um, from us and then assessing the resources, assembling the team, creating value, create a value catalyst. How are you going to be um, making your business worth exponentially more increasing right. the business durability? How can you uh, build the actual bulletproof business for a bulletproof Exit, which is the name of your book, and then right. living a, leaving um, your legacy and then thriving after the transition. Can we go, I think we have enough time to go and just give us a highlight on each one of these. Let's start with making the decision. Okay. Well, making the decision has to do with, um, it has to do with picking your target, if you will. So like a uh, Yogi Berra said something to the effect of, if you, if you don't know where you're going, you're uh, unlikely to get there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, right. So, so identifying, I've got, you know, a kid that works in the business. He's been, he's been here 10 years. He's working up the ranks. He's, you know, everything is doing right. And we're planning for that. So that's kind of the target. I'm going to allow this son of mine or this daughter of mine to take over the business and we're going to build a plan around that. Now there may be other siblings and so we've got to deal with those issues too. And so you got a lot of family pieces that come in, but ultimately making the decisions or who do you want it to transition to or sell to? Yes. When do you want to do it timing wise? What, what's good for you? Uh, and then how much do you need from that to live the life that you intend to live? So, and, and then also what if, um, I want my son to take over my business and my son wants nothing to do with the business. You actually have conversations with the people and you've shown parents and I read it in the book. You showed there was a, there was a, a father that said, Oh yeah, my son's going to take over the business. And you had a conversation with the son and the son says, I want nothing to do with the business. <laughs> and the father was just assuming it's like, Oh my gosh, he never talked to the child. Yeah. We had that happen a, a, a time or two with uh, key employees too, when there were no kids involved and there was a natural successor of a guy that was supposed to take over. And he basically said, I'm sorry, I'm not your, I'm not your exit target. Even though the guy started working with me and was sure he was the man, you know, yeah. but he's like, I'm retiring and moving to Mexico. Oh my gosh. And I, and I'm not going to work anymore. And here the boss or the owner of the company is, is banking no pun intended, on um, the employee taking over the business. Right. That's crazy. Okay, so let's go to assessing the resources, chapter two, assessing the resources. Uh, I'll start with the business side because as we know, you and I know that the business tends to make up somewhere between 70 and 90% of the family's net worth. Yes. It is a big deal. That's why, that's why getting this business piece, a lot of people spend so much time on their IRA or their investing piece or whatever it is. But for business owners, the most invaluable asset they have is that business. Yes. So um, assessing the resources on the business side has to do with, 
getting evaluation. So we, we like to have valuations done near the early part of our engagements because it gives us a peg in the sand that we can measure from going forward. It also brings, and they typically are what we call financial valuations because a true valuation of, um, I call it price discovery of what your business is ultimately worth at market will only occur when you're at market. And there is true price discovery because we are, uh, ho hopefully we're running a controlled auction process and we have three, four, five buyers at the table and they're bidding for the company. And that helps us, that helps us get to true price discovery. Yep. But apart from that, because we're not selling at this point, we value businesses sort of Wall Street historical ways. There's three or four methods of uh, valuing businesses depending on the kind of business. And, and like right now, I have one of my clients is doing a tax um, evaluation for tax purpose for gifting. And so there's a, the IRS requires certain kinds of things to be included in that valuation so that they know it's worth, you know, X or whatever. So anyway, we like to have a valuation done on the business to give us a, a, a sense of where we really are in value there. And then um, resources, we turn to look at the family to see, you know, um, what kind of uh, net worth do they have outside of their company? And it's one of the things we'd like to work on over time because many times when we take families, they have almost nothing outside of their business. Mm -hmm. So we start, yes. we start trying to build the family, having the family benefit from the business as well as the family benefit the business, you know. So yeah. it should go both ways if we're doing this right. So um, yeah, assessing the resources. Also, uh, I would say that that resources includes both sort of talent in the in the business itself, whether or not there's um, you know, unique technology or something that they have, which maybe nobody else has, uh, and then assessing the, the strengths within the family. What are the kids like? What are the, what are the husband and wife? How's the relationships between everybody? Just kind of seeing where we're starting. I mean, I have to say, and Ellen will tell you this, my daughter, Ellen, which you know well also, has worked with me for like eight years now super smart. I don't, I couldn't do what I do without her really. She's just incredible. But um, she, she helps me, you know, figure out these things. It's kind of fun to work with your child. And so I see having a, uh, and, and a number of my kids have worked in my businesses as they, as they've grown up. So I get an inside look at assessing the, the resources of a family in, in many different ways. And so it is kind of cool to understand what you have in each place, what the strengths and weaknesses are, what the holes are, what the gaps are, and what the dream is, and what the gap between what you have and what you want is. And that, that becomes our, the beginning of the roadmap then. That has to be, if not the most critical movement move for you with a business owner, uh, because I remember doing an evaluation of a company and going back to the CEO and saying, this is what you've got. And, um, and I was doing a turnaround back then. And it's almost like it's in black and white. Yeah. You wanted your, your, two, your son and your daughter to take over your business. They don't get along. Right. Their spouses are pulling them in opposite sides. And you really are thinking that when you die, this is going to get better. Yeah. And so things like that are are a jolt to the CEO. So in, in that instance, I don't think you are the person for everybody because if somebody is not willing to look at the truth and to really get down and really observe their business, and if right. they just wanna be kind of in their, in their nirvana mind, thinking that things are beautiful and don't want to get any feedback, that wouldn't be your ideal client. No way. Because like I always say to people, um, you know, by the time we're finished with this, we're going to know more about you than anybody other than probably your spouse and kids, because we're going to know more than the lawyers, because we're going to see what they see. We're going to know yeah. the CPA sees. We're going to see what the, even the health information comes into play. I mean, all kind, you know, it's a big kind of swirling, but we end up knowing our people very well. Some of the, some of the work we do is as quick, like I said, as 18 months. I have clients still at eight or nine years that are still, we're still working with because they just, they don't want to let us go. 
you know. Wow. That, and I can see that. I mean, I've been working with you for a long time and we've done anywhere between negotiations where you come in to do negotiations for me, where you've really assessed um, who I'm going into partnership with. Are they completely aligned? Um, what company am I going to be looking at joining or merging or going on a board of or whatever, just to make sure that everything is aligned. And ever, ever since I've been working with you, I feel like... Um, uh, First of all, just so everybody knows, I don't make a move without talking to Randy um, on my business. And, uh, and so when I went to get on a board, I called Randy. Hey, Randy, this is the person. Can I get you on the phone with them? You know who I am. You know how I am. You know my line. You know my values, my virtues. You know what I'm trying to accomplish in this world. And if they weren't aligned, you would have said, and you've said that to me in the past many yeah. years ago, you know what, you probably don't want to do this one because I know how you are and this is what you want and this, this is what they want. Do you really want to do this? And so you need somebody else, even though you are completely firm on who you believe and what you believe, you need another pair of ears and, 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 and someone else to kind of look at it. So now let's go to assessing the team. I think we got into the resources and also assessing the team. You actually come in and help assess. Yeah, assembling the team is about um, making sure that, like a baseball team, you know, you, you want to try to have uh, people with the right tools and the right strengths and the right positions, and you want the best you can get. Um, so... Uh, you want people that are qualified in the areas for which we need them to work. Too often I come in and, um, you know, people in general don't know how to assess lawyers and accountants and such because it's not what they do. So this is no denigration to them. It's just that sometimes I'm brought in and, you know, this is my lawyer and he's going to work with us on this. And then I, I interview the lawyer. I look at his, his background, his credentials and his work and his background doesn't fit what I need. To accomplish with this guy and I have to gently tell him you can keep your lawyer for the purpose you had him but he cannot be the lawyer for the work that we're going to accomplish he's not he's not suited for it his background and experience etc he's not prepared to do this work and he won't be a he won't be a partner that will be helpful to us and so assessing the team understanding what what kind of lawyers do we need CPA valuation people um, you know like I, I remember this, like I said, we were having a uh, financial valuation done for one of our companies out of uh, Michigan and um, right now. And I pulled up, you know, I have, I'm, I'm like you, I have contacts from 30 years. And so I've used people that are trustworthy that I've seen successfully over the years. And so many times I bring in the people that we need because there's nobody around them that's competent depending on how big, you know, the smaller they are, the easier it is to find professionals that can help at that level. But the bigger you get, the more compl complicated your life and the business life is. And so it is very important to have, you know, we want, we want a good financial planner at the table. We want a good insurance professional at the table. Property casualty is a big deal. We talk about, we find mistakes in that all the time both mm -hmm. in the personal and the business side. And so it just kind of rounding out the team so that when you're ready to take the field, oh. everybody knows what they're doing and they're really good at their position. Yes. Um, right. uh, what kind of mistakes do you normally find? You said you find a lot of mistakes in property casualty. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a great, I'll, I'll tell you a couple I find. Uh, one of them is that um, people view their business professionally. And so like one of the companies we, we work with, which is a good size company, uh, over a hundred million um, in value, we, we reviewed all their property casualty insurance. I found one mistake, which wasn't really a mistake. It was just nobody followed through to put the insurance in place. They had done all the work. It was just, it didn't complete execution. So I found that everything else is, it was absolutely pristine. Then I went over to look at the personal side and the, in the personal side, the business owner had um, liability policy of $500,000 on his home and his autos. Oh, and, wow. Uh, when I said to him, I said, you know, because his wife and he, he had a, a vehicle and his wife had a vehicle and all the other vehicles were owned by the company, but these two were personal. So I said to him, 
you know, if your wife runs a red light and kills me, um, my wife is going to, uh, she's going to be a player in your company. He said, what do you mean by that? I said, well, your net worth is mostly in your company and um, you have $500,000 of liability insurance. And I promise you, you will not settle my death for $500,000. Ain't going to happen. So where's the money going to come from? Maybe the net worth out of your business, maybe out of something else, but there's a judgment and you can afford to pay it. So, and I have another a story too, which is, is a one that's really terrifying to me. And we had a trucking company we worked with that came to see us and they wanted us to kind of help them do estate planning. But when we, they came to us, they were a sole proprietorship. This was a case I had in California, sole proprietorship. And um, of course, and, and unin so they're unincorporated mm -hmm. and they have liability insurance of $500,000. And, you know, California is the most, you know, this look, one of the most litigious yes. states in the country. And it so is. I said to him, why aren't you incorporated? Oh, he says, well, my CPA said I didn't need to, to be incorporated because uh, it, it wouldn't help me tax wise. Remember I talked about having the right people on the team. Absolutely. Because you gave him terrible advice. And, so, and, and, and for, for people who are watching right now, cause we're live here. Um, you know, your, your CPA is only going to focus on one area. Your attorney is going to focus on another area, on the law part of it, on the legal side of it. Your financial planner is going to focus on a totally different area from a financial planning perspective. It's almost like, you know, when you have, when you have, when you're going to go have an operation, you don't just have the expert in that particular field. You have other people to see, okay, if we touch this, how is that going to affect the other part of the body? It's not any different. So right. go ahead. I just wanted to make yeah, that no, analogy that's, because that's, I want the business owners that are currently watching right now to see that. Yeah, it's a great point. The, the way this came out, we finished the work, we incorporated them. We put in place um, $10 million liability policy. And uh, about six months later, I get the phone call that there has been an accident um, you know, one of the trucks was running empty and it had some steel bars kind of tied on the flatbed and one of the bars worked its way out and bounced onto the road and went through a windshield. Oh and my it gosh. Wasn't pretty. So, but the good part about it is that, and I don't mean this, you know, obviously the family is, is really, really impacted on this, but if, but if that family would have been um, if it had happened to him prior to the to our work, he wouldn't have had much assets to be able to take care of them with, right? In this case, because we had a ten million dollar liability policy, that ten million dollars they they settled the case for ten million dollars to make the family whole, right? So he he got to keep the business, which he's extremely lucky that he did. They got ten million dollars. Everybody's a winner because there was planning done. If there is no planning, everybody's destroyed. You know, it's terrible, honestly. It is. So those and, those and, are the kinds of things. And, and I think that the, the, the individuals, and I'm not just talking about business owners, this is the family members, this is our livelihood. And we're thinking that we have a certain amount and okay, I can do with that amount, but we don't know what we don't know. And this is where you come in because, and you've given me that advice is, Betty, you need more. I, and I thought that whatever I had in life insurance or whatever it was, it was going to be enough because that is what I live on right now. But my income is going to be gone when I die. So what is that going to look like? Right. So, so it's so there's, it's so complex when you get into it, you almost, and then you get your emotions into it. And that's when we get ourselves in trouble when we get our emotions into it. And you know, especially if, it, if you're a business owner, this is your baby. Oh, um, right. Let's go to um, your fourth chapter, create a value, create value catalysts. Mm -hmm. How are you going to make your business worth exponentially more? I have learned more about that from you than, oh my gosh, I, would, I, I, I thought I knew so much and I've been in this business for such a long time and here you come. So can you yeah. enlighten us? So we've talked about the one um, that I, I think is kind of the foundational piece, which is building a management team. 
yeah. that can that can run the company, that can grow the company, run the company, and free you up. And I love to tell my business owners, look, I'm. It isn't that I'm I'm f- trying to force you to sell. It's that I want you to be able to live the life that you you really want to live. And so a number of our business owners have gotten to the point where they um, they still own the company. The management team runs the company. Um, a couple of them travel about not some of their home now, you know, because of the COVID world. But prior yeah. to COVID, you know, they were traveling 50% of the year, literally. Um, and, and then while they're traveling, though, we, we keep them um, travel with a purpose. So I like them to have fun, but I also like them to be able to visit other countries and other companies that do similar things in their field so that they can stay ahead on what's coming down the line. And then they can come back with ideas for the management team, you know, on changes or updates, things. It's, it's one of my clients is a very large farmer. I won't say what kind of business, but they, he is, uh, has been traveling the world for probably seven years now. And his only job is to find new varieties. Oh, wow. And so he travels all over Israel, Greece, everywhere, you know, and then going in and deep and getting to know farmers and who's growing what and, you know, uh, and nurseries around it. So it's, it's the, that, that's kind of my point is it isn't that I'm trying to take them away necessarily from loving the business. I'm just trying to get them to use, to be at a point in their career where they're, their highest and best use is, is, is with their mind. Yes. Not having them physically in the chair. You know, I was talking to a general early this morning um, and she worked um, uh, for the White House and the Pentagon and I've had her um, here before and I'll, I'll bring her back because, you know, from a leadership perspective, uh, what I find is um, when you first start your business, you start because of a passion, not because you're really good at running a business, but because you have a passion at cooking, you have a passion at whatever it is, right? Uh, and, and then you start growing, you have to learn how to do this. And when you get to a certain level, and this is what you're talking about, uh, the best use of your time is to have the best team around you so that you can delegate for them so that you can do your own genius. What is it that your genius is? What's your superpower? You've got to be able to have the right team around you and not just the right individuals, the right numbers of individuals and the right combination of individuals so that the combined, you make a good enough team so that you then can go out and utilize your own genius that nobody else has. Why? Because you're the one that has the years of experience behind you. Your decisions are going to be a lot quicker. If you leave it for somebody else, they don't have the experience. And that's where I've seen businesses and families completely fail. And it does when, when you get to be uh, taken out of the day-to-day management, it frees up mind space and your creativity explodes. Oh, it's, 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 a, it's a good, it's good thing. So that's one of the things is management team for the benefit of everybody. Yes. Secondly, a, a diverse customer base is very helpful because if I've got a company that has one major client, I'm going to get a, uh, and, that, and that may be fine. I may be making good money. But somebody that's going to buy the business is going to discount that business pretty precipitously because they know if we, they lose that one company, there is no company. That's right. And well, we we don't we like to see no no business um, no relationship be more than ten percent of the of the income or the revenue of the business. So that's kind of oh my gosh, it's ten percent. We don't like to see one any more than ten if we can help it. Wow. We like well, it to, I. I've seen it where one one business, and right now with COVID, this is the time because a lot of businesses are pivoting and, and pivoting right after they pivoted already, they're starting to pivot again. Right. And um, in having that diversification is so Definitely. important. We always talk about it, diversification and investments. Yeah. That's right. Um, another one that I I, I don't think – people think of as necessarily as a catalyst, but from my perspective, having recurring revenue and, and growing, a growing recurring revenue combination uh, business, people that are buying businesses, they love that because they don't have to go in and recreate everything every year and resell everything. 
they know that there's a loyal customer base that loves what they do. And that, so that means every year they, they build from the prior year. They don't, they're not building it, you know, starting over on selling. It's like a, it, on a product level, when it, whatever you're selling, you're selling new every year. But when you've got recurring revenue because of businesses, um, services, or, um, or some sort of a product line that continues to evolve every year, like software as an example, you know, you, you might update the software, but the software is still the accounting software. Yes. You follow me? Yes. So those are, those are some things that can make, uh, add some exponentiality, if you will, to business. And I, I'll do one more. We could keep going. But uh, another one that comes into play, I think, that gives a catalyst is, um, is a proprietary technology. So you have invented something, you've thought of something, you've patented, and I, I work with a couple of patent lawyers for our clients, you've patented this thing, and you know the idea that you've spent, you, you might have, if somebody just looked at the numbers, and it shows you know, you've spent a, a lot of money, your revenue hasn't been great the last three years, it, it might not seem like the company's worth much, but, but when you get behind the numbers and you look and see that the money was spent to develop a new technology, Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, the technology is ready to go into business. Now, it explodes it, you know. So, those are, those are a few um, of the idea what of value catalysts, yeah. And you've got an eye, um, because I've seen how you think. Uh, I've had enough experience personally with you um, and, and, you know, the businesses that I have, that I have, um, that you and I have looked at have been not as big as some of the ones that you um, normally do, but I, but nonetheless, I've seen how you think and, and you will always come up with something that I'm not even thinking about, even though my first business that I started, I was 19 years old. So I am a veteran in in having had several businesses. And I, I don't always think of the right thing. It could be right in front of me, but when you're emotionally tied to something, um, somehow your objectivity goes out the window sometimes in certain areas. It, it does, and everybody's built with certain skill sets. Like you, I, I think of you, one of your great skills, I think, is as a turnaround specialist. You can go in and understand where, where weaknesses and things are breaking down. You know how to build culture. You know how to, to, to create leadership that's failing in a company. I mean, you have certain things. And then turning the company around to make it profitable again when, when everybody seems to want to give up hope on it. You, you have that kind of vision to flip things around, uh, which is obviously a skill set I'm not as great at as you would be, for sure. But... So you have, you think certain ways. It's the yeah. things that, that are outside of that. And, and yeah. so I've tried to, that's why I said my background is not, I couldn't do this work in the first 15 or 20, probably 15 or 20 years of my career because I didn't have a broad enough background yet. Because I really think the thing that sets us apart from most of the people that now, you know, now there's the last two years, everybody decides that they're an exit planner all of a sudden, but, but we've been doing it a long time. And the thing that I think sets us apart from most of these people is, you know, I'm not an insurance guy selling insurance. I'm not a certified financial planner selling, um, I'm managing money for our clients. Uh, I'm, I, we don't have um, a vested interest other than that they pay us for the advice. Yeah. Right. And that's it. And that's it. And that's what makes you so much better. And the, I mean, let alone your integrity and your reputation precedes you. Uh, but let's continue with the book. We have another 11 minutes left and okay. it's perfect. So, so creating um, value catalyst, we talked about how, to, how, do, you, how do you make your business um, exponentially more? And some people are asking, when is the book available? Um, because they seem to be really interested in yeah, it. it. It seems to, it's supposed to be released, I think, uh, October 31st. So we're about two weeks away. Okay. Okay, so once the book is released, um, perhaps you can come back um, after it's been released. And then I was thinking about pairing you up with someone who, um, who uh, uh, does a lot, who funds businesses like this for growth, yeah. um, or maybe um, some of your team, and we can have a dialogue with maybe some of your team and talk about how do you go into the business and all of that and, and explain it more once people actually get, can get their hands in the book, their hands on the book. Um, so uh, uh, the next chapter is chapter five, increase your business 
durability? How can you bulletproof your business? And the interesting thing about, about kind of the whole process is that, that one, one, solving one problem sometimes solves multiple problems. Yes, if so you solve one the, the right problem. <laughs> one of those durability pieces is having a management team. Because yes. again, if something happens to you, if you're disabled, if you die, um, you know, the company doesn't fold. Um, yes. So that's one thing. Secondly, um, you know, having like buy sell agreements in place, having um, stay bonuses in place for people to make sure that if I want to sell my company in three years and I've got key employees that I know I need to be able to sell that business as part of my team, then we will build a, a plan to encourage them to stay at least a year or 18 months past the sale. And if they do so, they get a bonus of substantial amounts of money, typically six months to a year, year and a half of salary. So a pretty good number. And isn't it better to have those conversations when the employee is being engaged than having to do it at the very last minute? Because if I'm having to do it at the very last minute, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. stuck. And, and the price just went up, right? They, that's right. They have leverage against you. That's terrible. They, it's it's horrific. No. So if you're able to think about all of these things, then, then it's so much better ahead of time. And you can think about it peacefully. You're talking to the person when they're in a good position, you're both in a good position. And then it's a leveled equal conversation, which is how I like to do the negotiations, right? So where everybody's winning and not one is taking advantage of the other. Yeah, I do. I will say if, if you have more than one, if, if there's more shareholders or partners than just you, then you must have a buy-sell agreement. It prevents litigation, conflict. Um, and then I'll say one point too about um, funding it. Sometimes that is funded with life insurance on the partner's lives. Mm -hmm. Now, I find one of the mistakes I find is when I come in is that the company is deducting the, the policy. I mean, the, uh, is deducting the um, payment for the policy every year, okay? They're, so they're making it a business expense, they're buying the insurance, but they're deducting it. Um, the tax law basically says that if, if you're deducting that payment, then the, then the income, I mean, the proceeds from the life insurance policy, they're, not, they're taxable then to the company. Did you hear that? Yes, I just Because heard. the insurance people will come in and say, well, life insurance is tax-free when you get it. And that's true. But businesses, and, and the C, many times the CPAs aren't aware of it and aren't catching that kind of a thing. So there's all these little, you know, kind of things that nobody seems to, everybody get their, own, their arms all around. So we're looking for a bunch of things like that. Yeah, um, it, it's almost like they get, they get around their little piece of the pie, but not, not everything. It's like um, Adriana was saying, it's the same body in different organs. Each organ has its own little area and so each C cpa is looking for only one thing and then the advisor is looking for only one thing and so that's the problem there isn't a unified body that is looking at everything from a thirty thousand foot level view and who can actually bring the right team and that's where you were talking about assembling the right team is the right team that really can understand and can collaborate really well with one another that are not pushing to be the you know the number the territory one favorite or exactly. I want to be right. <laughs> yeah i know i know so let's go to the last chapter thriving uh oh living penultimate living your legacy and then thriving after transition yeah yeah the the living your legacy piece for me is trying to make people understand that i don't want them just to leave a legacy I want them to benefit during their lifetime and their family to benefit during their lifetime. I want them to have deep, you know, um, I want them to be economically successful. I want them to have a, a business that is, is extremely well run and financially successful and, uh, and the family is successful. It's got family and finance. And, and then I also love for them, most of the people we work with at some level have a, a deep faith in God. And so the living your legacy is the things that you want to pass down to your children. It, money is a small part of it. Living your legacy is what we give back to our, we, we, you know, we give to our employees and our, our kids and our, 
in our community. That's living a legacy so that everybody's benefiting from the, the work that you have done. And, and it's a blessing to you to be a giver instead of a taker. That's okay. living a legacy, right? Okay. Okay. I, now I get what you're talking about. You it's talk about legacy in, in, this, in all the industries that I'm aware of. It's always about the kind of money you leave and how it's going to be put in trust for the kids. And, yeah. and those things can be important, but they're a small part of the, what matters is legacy, truthfully. Yes. Yeah. Right. And it's thinking, it, it's interesting because I give a lot of thought to what legacy am I going to leave behind? Uh, and then also, how am I showing up today? So what you're talking about is more, am I showing up today in a way that would substantiate the kind of legacy that I want to leave? That's right. I just, I, to me, if you've been successful in raising your family and, and, you know, making your kids productive and your business is successful and you just decide that when you, when you transition out that all you're going to do is hit a golf ball around for the rest of your life, how is that benefiting anybody? You know, that is not a, I, I love for people to be able to play golf. Golf is not a life. Mm -hmm. That's my point. No. So this part about thriving after transition, which is kind of near the end here, we want the people to understand that we want all of our business owners, when they go, we want them to go to something, not just from something. And so working on that ahead of time, because most business owners, I'll tell you this from experience, most business owners will get depressed after the sale of the company. I don't yes. care if it's, yes, you know, and, just, and it isn't, and Randy, that's not just business owners. It's also people who have been working for a very large company and all of a sudden they're looking forward to retirement. They're looking forward to retirement. Somebody asked me this, this week, just this week. So are you ever going to retire? And I said, if it is your sense of retirement, like no. rocking in the rocking chair and going right. and golfing and playing tennis and doing that for the rest of my life, absolutely never. Yeah. I will do that when I, you know, I, I don't know, when, I, when my body just can't do it, that's when it'll happen. But what kind of retirement life do you really want? And it's, and it's kind of a transition into a different kind of a life, right? It is. And so are you living your legacy now? I had a conversation with um, uh, actually several people since COVID started and they were getting ready to retire. And they said, Betty, how did you do it? How did you leave? Because I, I was out of banking for, a f for exactly a year. Right. If we would have planned it, it wouldn't have been so perfect. That's why it was, a, I mean, it wasn't planned. This was not my plan. But, but you were busy that year. Right. Yes. Yes, you were. I, I was very busy. I was live. I, I was helping communities. I, I had a lot of different things, and it was because I had already built That's what right. my legacy was going you to be. Living yes. your legacy. I was already living it. That's right. I was a, so for me, the transition from executive vice president to CEO of my own company, it was a very natural move. It, it, it just, it just very smoothly. I just went in and then again, very smoothly. I just came back into corporate. So, so it's interesting that we tend to, again, back to my essence at the very beginning, and then I'm going to turn it over to you. We we tend to live our life as if we are never going to die. We tend to look at things myopically. That's right. And we tend to uh, only focus on what's right in front of us. So if we weren't living our life as if we're always going to live, if you thought that tomorrow, today's your last day, what would you do differently? Right. If you didn't have blinders and if you were able to open it up the only way to open it up is by bringing a team of people that are more qualified than you i know that i always say we don't do this alone and i don't and then if you weren't only focused on what's in front of you but really on living your legacy i love that i'm walking away with so much and i already read your book i'm walking away with more even living your legacy so Tell me, Randy, um, or tell us. Tell yeah, yeah, let me finish with one thing. If you okay, could. yes, go ahead. So my, my experience in this stuff is that the people that, that have peace, and I'm, I mean peace in life, you know, peace in relationships with spouse and children, peace with God, these are people that have determined to do what is right 
every day, right? So this, in, in understanding and having peace about what's going to happen to your business or what's going on in your business has to do with, um, you know, doing what is right. And when I say doing what's right, it's sometimes you can't, you don't have a feeling for what's right, which is where, you know, advisors come into place. They, they can give you a sense or a view of things that you don't see. They can help you, help you get enough information to make good decisions because ultimately I don't make the decisions. You know, the, the client will make them and the professionals will make them, but I want to tee it up so that everybody knows what our options are. And, and, and I tell them what I do if it were me, but I do not make the decisions. No, so, you can't. Right. So, but I'm bringing in my experience too shows me that when the business owner does what's right within his family and, and does this, this exit planning work, when we're finished with it or in the middle of it, you see the spouses many times we've, we've worked with people who are on the edge of divorce and the marriages have been saved because all of a sudden the spouse is brought in. They're part of the process. We don't work with the business owner alone. If we're not going to engage the family and the other shareholder, major shareholders, we can't do the work that matters. No, because that is the work that matters. And it's so interesting because there's a dialogue going on in the chat room uh, where people are talking about how the family is the most important business. Adriana just said the family is the most important business. At the end of the day, it's all about the family. Yeah, I mean, it's like um, uh, there's a guy I know that does a radio show and he says when he finishes his show he basically he basically says we should all now go home to what our real work is which is raising and and shepherding our families and this other stuff is a means to that it helps us get to it but it is not the thing right no <laughs> it, it is not the thing not the, the thing, thing is the thing and don't That's forget right. what the thing really is <laughs> So if you had one piece of advice uh, to the people who are watching and to the people who are going to be watching this, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, I've lived it personally um, since um, I took over my father's transportation business. Uh, since I started my first business, I was, you know, wet behind the ears. It was a manufacturing company and, and I didn't know what I was doing, but I did it anyway. And so um, what would what would your advice be to either business owners and to families who who are families of you know they they don't have a say so right now but they see their dad or their mom go to their business every day or go to their work every day right. what would be the best advice that you could give um, I would say start incorporating your children into your business life as soon as you can I mean like I said all of our children when there was you know, they're six, eight or whatever it is, we, they, they started, you know, vacuuming the floors and taking the trash out and, and eventually cleaning the bathrooms. And then they got old enough where that they, they could do things. We had a farm too, when we lived in California. And so we would have them do simple farm labor, you know, we, and, and they would do their, you know, my wife taught them how to do their own wash by the time they were six or eight. And after that, they were running the washing machines and doing their own clothes. Just, you know, making your children responsible and making them part of the business because they see that this is actually, this is me, you know? Yes. So, and, and even if they choose not to stay in that, it, it, it is a, the, a, a business that is incorporates the family can be really good glue as well as obviously as, as the faith side, but the business can also be a glue that helps keep families together. In the book, we use some examples of families that have their family businesses from like the 1600s that are still operating and how they did it, things like that. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, just uh, incorporating your family into your life so that your business benefits the family and the family benefits the business. And that is, that way you can live your legacy instead of just trying to hope to leave some pot of money sometime, right? Yeah, because that pot of money uh, the chances of that pot of money being in existence for another generation are just about. That's typically correct. Unless they're well-trained, like I said. That's right? the only time. Absolutely. Right. So when they're well-trained and they want to be there and they appreciate it and they know exactly what's going on. That's the only, that's the only time I've, I've lived it in my own family. I've lived it in my friends and, and, uh, in many a clients. So Randy, thank you so much for taking this time. Um, I have always known you to be, um, 
a, a, a giver, an abundant giver, and um, you live uh, a life of values and virtues. Um, I know you personally, and um, and I can't thank you enough for everything that you have done for my family personally, because uh, what the conversations that we always had around uh, my business or uh, things that I wanted to do and all of that, um, uh, and how you've prepared me personally, um, generations, you know, for generations, it's just wonderful to have somebody like you by my side. And if it isn't Randy, you need somebody, somebody that, that knows as much. So I love your book. Um, and uh, I can't wait to be able to share your book with the world because it was such an amazing book or it is such an amazing book. Thank you so much for being with us. And to everybody, um, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, please, yeah, you know, save a business, save a family, save a life. So please just forward this, not because I want any notoriety. I want to make sure that people, we gave a lot of value. And thank you, Randy. You shared so abundantly and so freely um, that I know that just this video alone will get people to kind of think twice about how they're running their business, how they're running their life. And, and if you can share and share abundantly, I would very much appreciate it. And I know that the people that receive it will appreciate it. Thank you, Randy, for being with us. You're so welcome. And I'm thankful to be here. And the good Lord has been good to me. And I try to share what he's given to me. You know, he's been yes. so good to me. And so, you share so you. abundantly. Thank you so much. Love being with you as always. <laughs> I know, likewise, likewise. It's fun. Bye everyone. Bye-bye.